Good morning and thank you all for coming. I'm Ed Tomey. I'm going to be your moderator for the day. Uh, and I won't say too much about the design of our day right now because I want to introduce the person who's going to welcome us. Uh, we all know her and her work. Uh, our state, the state senator from District 10, um, Molly Kelly. Uh, since I were first worked with Molly many years ago, has stayed focused on education and collaboration and building community. And it's an appropriate person to invite up here to welcome us all to, to this particular day, which we'll describe more of after we hear from Molly. Senator Kelly, please. collaborations and the partnerships between educators and business. We know, as I think you have up here, um, that we have a challenge to prepare our workforce. And I don't think we can continue to do this the way that we've always done this before. Uh, I think most of you know that. Uh, so I think today, when you talk about Manadnock moves, I think about all of the things that Manadnock does. When we move, and in particular, all the collaborations, are we not the best collaborators in the world and partners in the world here in Manhattan? <laughs> so today you're going to focus on education and moving. Um, and I just have to say that I've had uh, the privilege and really the honor, and some of you are here today, Mary Paterno, Sue Newcomer, uh, Vic, there's Vic Kessler. Um, <clears throat> I have been able to chair uh, the uh, governor's uh, advanced Manufacturing and Education Advisory Council. And that's just exactly what we do, is what you're doing today, is we sit around the table, bigger table, and we talk about what's happening in advanced manufacturing. And the educators ask the manufacturers, what do you need from us? And the, and the, and the, the manufacturers then have to respond to the educators and say, what can we do to be helpful to get you there? We need a skilled workforce. We need an educated workforce. We need a workforce that is prepared for the 21st century. And one of the things that we found in our council is that some of the most essential players to make this happen are guidance counselors. And how many of you here today are guidance counselors? And that's wonderful because that was one of the things that we found we didn't have and a connection to. So that you've come here today and talk uh, with each other and listen as to what we need and to work. And the reason I think that it's so important that you as guidance counselors are here today is because you play one of the most essential parts in bringing this collabor collaboration together. Because you, as counselors, you work with students every day, you are their vision to their future. You are the ones who say and can prepare them and give them that vision I know I had walked in a high school one day into, um, into the area of the technology, and there was a young man there, and he was just kind of shuffling his feet, looking at his feet, walking across the room. Obviously, totally disengaged in what was going on. <clears throat> and yet he enjoyed working with his hands. There were computers there that he loved to work with. And I had just come from one of our advanced manufacturing uh, businesses uh, that morning before, and I had seen what we are doing in manufacturing, and it's pretty incredible, and it's pretty exciting. And I said to him, I started to tell him, give him the vision of what that was, and what that looked like, and what they were making. And his eyes got bigger and brighter, and I said, and it's you that we need. You are the person that we need to grow our economy and to create jobs, and that's what's really important. And I don't think that he had a vision of what manufacturing was. You all 
um, may or may not, they need to get out and to see that. Where are we going in healthcare? Where will we be five or 10 years from now? You're the vision for the students to know where we're gonna be. How about banking and finance? Uh, we have no idea where that will go, and I know you have people here to talk about that, and tourism, which is one of our greatest resources here in New Hampshire. So don't forget that you are the vision for those students and uh, play such an essential and incredible, incredible part in that. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to, uh, to mention and think about is that when we talk about collaborations and we talk about partnerships and working together, we really uh, are thinking about redefining I think the way to the future and what we look at is outcomes for students and how prepared that they will be. I think we have to redefine our classrooms. I don't think the classroom any, can any longer just be that room in the school. I think that our banks, I think our hospitals, I think that our manufacturers are our labs. And today you have an opportunity to talk with them and to see what they, what they can bring and offer to education as well. In fact, I would go so far as to say that our community is our school and that we have many resources, we have buildings, we call those our schoolhouses, but we as a community, we are the school and we bring that all together with all of you listening, talking, talking about what's the future, what we need, how can our students be career and college ready and in particular to truly, truly have an educated and trained workforce for the 21st century. So I wish you all well today. I won't be able to stay. There is work waiting for me in Concord, and I'm gonna to have to get on that Route 9 one more time <laughs> and get there. But I wish I could be here, and I know people, like Sue Newcomer, will let me know what's happening and going on. And thank you all for being here. Thank you for the work that you do. Can't uh, tell you how important it is what you're gonna be doing today. So thank you. Senator Kelly very much, and especially for the question that is the most useful question I have found in my entire life, and I've had a long entire life, uh, which is how can I help? Not just this is what I want, but how can I help? I'd like to welcome now uh, to the podium uh, Jim Logan, the director of the Cheshire Career Center, who is the person responsible for convening us and bringing us together and providing direction and allowing us all to have voices in where this day ought to go. Uh, and Jim will have some opening words for us. Jim Logan. Thank you. I don't know how much direction I've given to this conference, but I would like to thank everybody that's here today. This conference, or this meeting, was the result of a conference that I attended uh, last year in Nashville called Pathways to Success. And there was, Basically, manufacturers at this. It was. Uh, it was. There was a keynote there by the name of uh, Bill Simons, a Harvard educator, who was a co-author with uh, a document called Pathways to Prosperity. The Pathways Prosperity to Prosperity document had some pretty significant findings in it about education, and I, I believe that we can all agree on the, the basic message of the document: that we want all of our students to complete high school that we want all of our students to obtain some type of a post-secondary credential that's valued in the industry. And the other piece that's important, we want all students to start themselves on a career track with the idea that lifelong education is important to pursue. Um, after Bill Simons got done speaking, we broke out into I guess breakout sessions, and it was probably regionally by the south part of the state middle and then the upper tier. And there was probably 60 to 65 people in this room when it broke out. And I, as an educator, I was the minority in that room. And it, it was going around the table, and, and there was some really, I guess, strong opinions about education and where education should be going. Uh, when it got time for me to speak, you know, I, I, I welcomed it, I valued what they were saying, and I, I also gave the time out thing that, you know, I believe that this is a good conversation to take place. And that I would be willing to convene a little group and come up with an idea and, and start the conversation locally. 
because where we were in Nashville, it was, I could see it wasn't going to get us anywhere. It was too big of a group, and it was just the manufacturers, not that you're not an important group, but it's a collective idea, the community, that I wanted to pull together. So with that said, um, I was discussing that, you know, the manufacturers and the business industry people need to know what demands are placed on students today, what a student's palette looks like in education, what we as educators are working with, the, the confines that we work within, within the public school setting. Um, and with that, I said it would be nice if we could have some business and industry people talk about their industry and what's going on in, in, in their industry and let the educators know what's happening out there. So with that being said, um, Sue Newcomer jumped right on board with the Keen Chamber of Commerce, the Keen Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Sue Silk was involved in it, and Kim Baker from the high school. And we met, and we came up with a bunch of great names and people that could help us come up with this idea. Um, so a planning committee was formed, and collectively uh, we brainstormed, uh, we shared, we discussed, and we came up with this idea for today, which we call Manadnock Moves. And you know, it's funny as we talk about this, Manadnock Moves, Pathways to Success, Pathways to Prosperity, it's all about moving. And you know, I, I want to thank the members of the committee because we did a lot of work in a short period of time. And at this point of the day, I would like to recognize them. Um, Sue Newcomer from the Greater Chief Keen Chamber of Commerce, Workforce Development. Sue Silk, our co-op and career counselor at the Cheshire Career Center. Kim Baker, the director of guidance at Keene High School. Ted McGreer, owner of Ted Shum and Sport. Paula Huda, the director of clinical practice and education at Cheshire Medical Center, Dartmouth Hitchcock Keen. Ken Abbott, the president of Abtech Incorporated. Jennifer DeCoste, the assistant director for Keen, Keen Community Ed. Ed Tomei, the organizational and leadership consultant, executive advisor. And Mary Letourneau, the New Hampshire Department of Education and program liaison. These people were instrumental in making this event today. This wasn't a Jim Logan show. It wasn't a Cheshire Career Center show. It was a community show. And at this time, I would like them to stand and be recognized for their hard work. I would also like to thank the Greater Keene Chamber of Commerce for the support they provided, <coughs> along with the New Hampshire Department of Education for supplying the Pathways to Prosperity document that you have in your folder and, the, um, and taking care of the registration folders. I would also like to thank our speakers and facilitators that are going to be with us today and thank them for their commitment. Um, I believe it's going to be a productive day. And, you know, it is about moving forward, and it's not about, I guess, pointing the fingers. It's about coming up with, with uh, I guess, a plan going forward, and Ed is going to, I guess, walk us through this today. And I'm very appreciative to everybody being here and everybody that helped put this together. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we're going to get ready to start our program for today now, and I want to um, want to frame it for you very simply. This morning, we're going to get input. We're going to hear a lot. I hope we're going to learn a lot. We're first going to hear from two presenters, and I'll introduce them shortly. We're going to talk about generational differences. I'm sorry, whenever I hear that in my mid-70s, I have to say I know a lot about generational differences. I have children and grandchildren. I mean, there are differences among us, I'm sure, that we all uh, can identify with that. But uh, that is not because we want you to hear a lot, but because we want to warm you up to become the presenters today. And so this afternoon will be dedicated to that traditional, now traditional, uh, mode of breaking us up into work groups where we can sit around a table of 12 or 13 or 14 and have a chance to have our voices heard given what we heard this morning, given what we learned today, given what we brought into the room that we already had from our own experience and, and, and our professions and our personal lives and our family lives. Given all of that, 
here are some of the ways that I think I can help. Here are some of the things that I need from someone across the table or people around the table to help me close the generation gap and make uh, to help make help career, career pathing for our young people and uh, success for our various employers, whether they be in healthcare, manufacturing, uh, tourism, uh, uh, retail, uh, any of the other manufacturers that any other uh, employers that we'll hear from this morning. So that's the whole idea. We'll get information this morning. We'll give information this afternoon. And then there'll be a, a next step part of it where we try to turn it into something happening. And as Molly said, we're the best at it. Wherever I go throughout New Hampshire and New England, I continue to hear about what happens in that southwestern corner of, of, of New Hampshire that everybody is quite envious of. So we'll keep that going today. Uh, one more thank you. Uh, you'll see, you see a video camera in the back here, and it's being operated by Bill Reeve of uh, Eastern Video, uh, and he's here uh, at his, on his own to record this for us today. And Bill, we thank you so much for that. Thanks. Uh, we'll be able to get that information. Yes, and there are six uh, work group facilitators that I'll introduce to you later, but they are here on their own today as well, trying to help build community. All right, let's get going on our first presentation of the day, and it's our keynote presentation. Um, and the introduction to that keynote presentation is that for the first time uh, in history, four generations are working shoulder to shoulder in the workplace. The traditionalists, <laughs> the baby boomers, yay, the generation Xers, and the millennials. You know who you are. <laughs> uh, each generation works differently, thinks differently, communicates differently, has a different set of needs to be met, to be heard, to be fulfilled. Uh, and this can have a dramatic effect on our working relationships. We know that. Our keynote presenters today, uh, Amy Lynch and Hannah, Hannah Yubel, uh, are with Bridgeworks. And Bridgeworks is a company that, uh, that uh, speaks and consults on generational issues. Uh, Bridgeworks founders authored the best-selling books When Generations Collide and The M Factor, How the Millennial Generation is Rocking the Workplace. Uh, Hannah and Amy have worked with clients as diverse as Johnson & Johnson, MTV, I say that's diverse, uh, <laughs> Boeing, and Ralph Lauren. Uh, they've been quoted in USA Today, The Washington Post, and on NBC Nightly News, among others. Together, uh, Amy and Hannah will help us explore generational differences as they play out in our work, and, uh, and they'll give us some techniques for blasting through generational differences. Uh, a shout out right now to parents who are struggling with generational differences at home. If you are a better parent as a result of today, I'm sorry, there'll be an extra charge. <laughs> so I hope you are as excited uh, as all of us on the planning committee are, and certainly as I am, to hear what they have to say. Please welcome to the Monadnock region uh, for the very first time, Amy Lynch and Hannah Yubel. Thank you very much. Ooh. There we go. Okay. So Amy and I, we are so happy to be here with you this morning. Um, first of all, this is such a beautiful town. And also we're in a region that so clearly cares about its community. And that's really wonderful to see because seeing industry and education and counselors come together like this is very rare. And Amy and I have been doing this for a while and we can truthfully say that we don't see it very often. And I can say too, as a millennial, it's really wonderful to see people coming together and working to understand my generation. So I do really appreciate that too. And as a baby boomer, I am a baby boomer. We'll get that out front, try to begin with. Um, I was really excited to be here too. And as a, a former teacher and as a businesswoman, this is a very exciting idea to me. And I was particularly pleased that I would get to visit with Hannah. Um, 
when she joined the Bridgeworks team, I was the <coughs> elder statesman on the team, and um, I was really excited because she came in with this energy. She was so young, and she was so cool. She was so bad. Yeah, yeah, was so young and so cool. <laughs> it's really, it's amazing actually how you are part of this young, cool, hip generation, and then you quickly realize that you are not anymore. Um, and I was actually reminded of this recently. Uh, I was I was talking to my brother, and he and his wife, they are the best parents. You know, they're the kind of parents who celebrate the firsts for all of their kids. I'm sure there are people in the room who do this too. You know, the first day of kindergarten, the first time you tie your shoes, the first time you ride a bike. So you can imagine that when you lose your first tooth, it's huge, right? It's like a circus comes to town. And their daughter, Ella, she recently lost her first tooth. So they got really, really excited because they have this whole thing that they do. They, they wait until she falls asleep. And then as soon as she does, they put a little dot of blue on her forehead and some glitter. So that when she wakes up in the morning, it's like a fairy. Ooh, okay. <laughs> That's really sweet. It's so over the top. But it's so sweet. It's so sweet. And, and, so, and so they're all ready for it. You know, she's about to go to sleep. And they're waiting in the wings, all excited. And then their older son walks by. And he's like, Mom, Dad, uh, what are you guys doing? He's like, what do you mean? What are we doing? The tooth fairy is coming. Come on, you, you know, shh. He's like, oh, guys, she knows the tooth fairy isn't real. Like, what do you mean she knows the tooth fairy isn't real? She's sick. She doesn't know up from down. How could she possibly know? And he looks at them and he says, she Googled it. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, I hear this story from my brother, and I'm like, what? I am ancient. This cannot be true. So now you know how I felt when you came to work at Bridgeworks. Now I know, yes, I have a better understanding of that. So, so these generational moments, these disconnects, these disconnects between the generations, when they happen, when they happen in our personal lives, they're kind of awkward, at painful, as Hannah's been yeah. learning. Mm -hmm. um, but when they happen in our working lives, in the schools and in the industries where we work, then they're serious because they cost us. They really cost us something. And just because of human nature, we tend to, you know, to teach as we were taught, we tend to manage as we were managed, naturally. But change has been moving so quickly that now those techniques that worked with one generation, maybe work with our generation, don't work with the next generation. It's endemic. It's all throughout the culture, in schools and in business. So if it doesn't work, then we have to learn the new techniques, the new ways of approaching the different generations to genuinely engage them, particularly the millennials, which we'll be emphasizing today. I'm so glad that as you work to do that and to prepare the workforce in the future, that you have chosen to use generations as kind of a building block, as a shared vocabulary, as a tool that you can use as you come together in this, this influence. Now, let us address the, the kind of the gorilla in the corner of the room, and that's stereotypes. Because when we think about the other generations, sometimes the first thing that pops up are those negative stereotypes, those, those assumptions we jump to. You know, I, I did walk in the snow both ways. I appeal to it. Yeah, I did. <laughs> those assumptions that we jump to. <clears throat> um, and when we do that, we go to a negative place. You know, we've all been in those conversations. This generation, that, in my time, this, you know, we've been in those conversations. What we want to do today is create a different energy, a positive energy, where we look at each other more genuinely. And that's one reason Hannah and I wanted to show you this particular campaign from Ameriprise, because it captures that productivity, innovation, and even fun that can come when the generations really do collaborate. Stuart, can I see you in my office, please? Please. Get in here. Thank you, Mr. Big. Stuart, I just opened my Ameritrade account. Let's light this candle. Let's go to Ameritrade.com. It's easier than falling in love. What do you feel like buying today, Mr. Big? Came on. So research it. All this stuff is provided for you free of charge. No cost. Yeah, that's synonymous with free. I'm sorry. Let's buy. Let's buy 100 shares. All right, quick get in there. Okay. How about 500? 100, Stuart. <laughs> I feel the excitement you have to buy and stop. Okay. Oh, that's thrilled. What that cost? Eight dollars, my man. Eight dollars. Yeah. 
eight dollars. Ride the wave of the future, my man. I get this is soda. All right, sorry, just no fee. I'm having a party on Saturday night if you really want to go. I'm gonna try and get there. Happy trading. Thank you. Thank you. Rock on. No, I'm sure. <laughs> Wait for the party. <laughs> So Ameritrade, they did the release this campaign into the marketplace, and it got a huge reaction. I mean, people were writing in, this is hilarious, I'm Mr. B, I'm Stuart, this is so funny. And Amy and I have seen it a countless number of times, and of course we still laugh, and notice you were laughing too. So I'm wondering if you can tell me, why is this so funny? Or what is unexpected about this commercial?
I'd like, we're gonna do an interactive exercise. I'd like for you to look on your tables and you'll find uh, some sheets that are upside down. And they have uh, four columns on them. What I'd like for you to do first is choose the column which applies to you. And look down that column. Look for things, not just things you remember, but things that help shape who you are today. Maybe shape the work you do today. Look for things that had an effect on you and helped shape you. Take just a couple of minutes and do that. And then we'll share that. Okay, thank you very, very much. I am always energized. By the energy of the conversations that emerge from this simple list. It's powerful how we sneak into those memories so quickly. And I urge you to take um, these handouts with you back and with your coworkers, with other teachers, with whoever you're working with, and share some of this because it can really can really prompt the conversation that helps you work together and understand each other. Sure. So um, I'm wondering if some of you in the room here, you know, we were kind of walking around and talking to a few people, and I'm wondering if anyone is willing to share a little bit about what they talked about at their table. If not necessarily about yourself, maybe something interesting you heard from someone else. I'll share. Okay. <laughs> Great. So what would you like to share? I'm leaving homework and looking down the list on the app and I'm going to Maybe what happened in our teens was more like a snapshot. That's so interesting you should say that because you probably know about the new research things that have come out in just the last few years that shows how our brains continue to develop and those frontal, frontal lobes in particular continue to develop well into our 20s. And so those, those uh, circumstances when we first enter the workplace often have a profound shaping effect on us too. Okay? Yeah. And you know, part of too, of who we are when we first enter that workplace um, you know, it, it, we talk about, for example, something like 9 11, clearly that impacted every single generation in a, in a profound way. But how it impacted, say, a 12 year old is very different than how it impacted a 27 year old. And so it's just kind of these qualities that a generation has somewhat unknowingly from their experiences in their teen years. And then that's what they hear that first time in the workplace, and then it kind of grows from there. So, yeah, thanks for sharing. It, it is very interesting. The, the brain chemistry around it is fascinating. Um, one more thing let's share before we move on. Um, who else would like to, to hear something that surprised you or found something that surprised you? Yes, Well, I wasn't surprised you, but I, uh, I'm big into who I raised my kids in one place. But, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting 
chills as you say this because it's bringing back that visceral memory. Yeah. For those years, see it happen. Spoken out of a true boomer, right? Yes. We said we could go to the moon, we did, and now we're back in space, right? We, we boomers, we're bullish always. It's mm -hmm. part of who we are. Right. And, and you know, I mean, we talked about a little bit at this table, we talked about for baby boomers, NASA and then the man on the moon, all those words, it, it does bring up chills because you get so excited and optimistic about this possibility that happened during your generation. Now, let's talk about Gen Xers. Gen Xers. I say NASA Gen Xers, what comes to mind? Challenger. Whoa, that's a down. Look at the difference between the optimism of a man on the moon and the devastation of the Challenger, and I'm watching that over and over and over on television. Very different era, very different generational shaping events. You know what? We have not heard from a millennial. I think we should. Yeah, is there one millennial in the room who wants to share something? <laughs> Millennials, come on, we know you're out there. Just, I think there are three. So not to put you on the spot. <laughs> I can help out if you say something, I'll say my memory of it or something. I just think there was a lot of like fear based things with 9 11 and Columbine. There's a lot of fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yes, thank you for sharing that. If you look on the millennial list, this is pointed out to us a lot. People are like, the first nine things are scary and depressing. <laughs> And it's true because as a generation, a lot due to technology, um, we were able to see scary things happen right away, and that's kind of the world we grew up in. So, you know, as we got older, we're very sensitive to privacy and, and safety um, a lot more from an early age compared to, to some other. Yeah, and you probably noticed that in the schools and in in the businesses, safety has become much more prevalent, and it's on, it's on the minds of millennials much more than on the older, gen the yeah. minds of older generations. And did you hear the funny comment at the front table when she said, "One of you from millennials, check the Facebook page." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's accurate. <laughs> okay, well, let's do music trivia. Let's do music trivia. Thank you, everyone, fun. for sharing. Really appreciate it. So, you know, I think that sometimes too, when we talk about the generations, everyone kind of it's it's competitive. You know, who has the best fashion, the best movies, the best music, the best rock stars. So we're going to tap into that competitive spirit a little bit and play some music trivia. <laughs> So at your tables, there should be a music trivia answer key. There's one page. So if you want to designate someone to fill out the answers, you have to really trust this person. You're playing as a team at your table. Yes, you're playing as a team. So the way it works, so this is how it goes. You're going to play a musical song, and then you're going to write down the name of the song, the name of the artist, and an answer to a trivia question. Okay, name of song, name of artist, answer to a trivia question. Two rules here. Do not shout out your answers because this is competitive unless you want to be strategic and shout out an incorrect answer or something. Everyone has their different strategies. Number two, absolutely no smartphones. No Shazam, no SoundCloud, no cheating, okay? All right, so here we go. Let's get started with music trivia number one. Okay, name of song, name of artist, and the trivia question is, what country does this singer hail from? What country does this singer hail from? Okay. I know I know it's like, Alright, music trivia number two. <laughs> okay, name of song, name of artist, and the question is, what was this singer's not-so-colorful nickname? What was this singer's not-so-colorful nickname? I kind of heard someone shut out an answer. <laughs> All right, music trivia number three. Name of song, name of artist. Trivia question is, this song 
was on the soundtrack for what 80s movie? This is Jim Jackson. This song was on the soundtrack for what 80s movie? Whenever we do this with millennials, at least one person in the room was in the play in high school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will come back to music trivia. Yes. We'll be <laughs> so you can just put those away and we'll bring them back out. But right now we're going to shift our focus. We're going to shift our focus to the millennial generation. So as the millennials have entered the workforce, we have caused massive collisions. And I'm sure that you're all kind of aware of some of those collisions. So what we want to do first is really give you an understanding of those events and conditions that shape who the millennials are and shapes how we are today in the workforce and in the classroom. So when we talk about millennials, of course, we have to talk about technology because it has played a huge role. And while other generations were kind of merging onto this information superhighway, we were, for better or for worse, born in the fast lane. And it completely shapes the way we do everything, the way we buy, the way we sell, the way we work, the way we learn, everything. But above all, it's completely changed the rate at which change happens. It's moving at a blistering pace. So I'll give you a perfect example of this. When I first entered school, Apple released one of their first personal computers, the Apple 87. I hear laughter. Does anybody okay. have this one? It looks ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did anybody have the Commodore? I did. Yes. <laughs> it played Pong. <laughs> So the total storage on this computer was 128 kilobytes. Just to put that into perspective, that is the size of one tweet on Twitter today. <laughs> so by the time I graduated from university, that computer had been turned into an iPhone that could download ringtones 10 times the size of the storage of the Apple 87. So another big way that the millennial generation experienced change was the way we experienced violence. And every generation had their fair share of violence, but for the most part, it was happening oceans away, or it was happening on TVs in your living room. But we are the generation of Columbine, of the 7-7-11 bombings, 9-11, Virginia Tech. Violence was happening in the desks next to us. So one thing that we do study is we look at public education funding, and we see after Columbine, there's this huge influx in funding for things like guidance counselors. And when we were growing up, we had these counselors, and we had our parents, and priests, and rabbis, and everyone was asking us to speak up. Everyone was asking us to talk about how we felt, and to bring our voice to the table, and they were asking our opinions from a very early age. So as a result, this has made us an incredibly collaborative generation. Mm, the generation had a voice. Yes. Now, we baby boomer parents are partially responsible for that. I'll, I'll take credit. I have two millennial daughters. And I did talk with them about basically everything. How many boomer parents are in the, Did you pretty much talk with your kids about everything? It was a time as 90s. We felt like we needed to. It was a way of keeping them safe. But when I was growing up, I couldn't talk to my parents about everything. Uh, what were some of the things, if you're, if you're my age, <clears throat> what were some of the things you could not talk to your parents about? <laughs> but listen, we can say it now. Did you hear that? We have come so far. Yes. <laughs> Sex, money, drugs, there were a lot of things that were off the table. Not so for our millennial kids. We made decisions uh, with them, family decisions. They had a voice in those decisions. It was collaborative, and we discussed everything with them. Another thing that was different for my generation was that at 18, I was out the door. It was mutual. My parents were ready for me to be independent. I was ready to be independent. Yeah, that was like, that was, so it was an agreed upon event. For the millennium generation. Hannah and I recently found uh, a Google ad that just, it just came out in the last couple of months that really nails that ongoing collaborative relationship between boomer parents and millennial young people.
gotta go call my daughter. So. I know. <laughs> it's such a sweet commercial. So we do, we have these close relationships with our parents, and we're really tech savvy, and we're really collaborative. But um, we definitely have some issues as well. And um, we know, we, we've been referred to as narcissistic, entitled, lazy. Um, and you know, if we don't just hear these on the street, it's everywhere in the news. <laughs> Um, we are we are well aware of all these different. Are they or just lazy? I, I don't know. I don't know. So you know we are well aware of this. So that's really what we're going to be spending our time on the rest of today is talking about these obstacles and talking about where millennials are bumping up against other generations in today's workplace. We're going to destroy our cities. What are you going to do to us? This I don't so know. Serious. I mean, I have to say, as a millennial, of course, I'm biased, but. I don't think that all of these are true. <laughs> and we'll talk about that. Well, that's amazing, but I have to say, <clears throat> I do remember similar headlines about my generation. Yes. We were, we were navel-gazing hippies. We were uh, going to destroy civilization, as, as it was known. So you know, maybe there is a little hype around this. Um, first, as we look at the generations today, and we look at the way that millennials this generation is going to destroy our cities. Um, this, if you look at how that millennial generation is bumping up against each of the other generations, then we'll be able to define some of the differences and some of the solutions to that. Let's look first at the traditionalists. Sometimes people say, oh, wait a minute, why are we taking the traditionalists when there aren't many of them left in our businesses or in our schools? But we must look there. We must look there because traditionalists were builders. They built our schools, they built our businesses, and their style of leadership and their style of communication is with us today. Absolutely. What shaped that generation? That generation of builders? A couple of things come to mind. Uh, the Great Depression. I can walk into my house today and say to my traditionalist mother, Oh, Mom, that's a beautiful dress. Do you know what she says? This old thing. It was on sale. Yes, she would tell me to the penny how much it cost. To the penny. Yes, because she learned the value of the penny growing up. Then there was World War II and all that that entailed for the people who served, and the women who served, and for their families. So we get a generation that is intensely patriotic, physically conservative, loyal, and most of all has faith in institutions. Whether that institution is your school, or your business, they believe in that institution as a way of making the world better. That's a profound faith that that generation had as they built the institutions that serve us today. That's, yes. Yeah. I also feel like they had faith in Yes, and a religious faith, absolutely. A profound faith. And that's a legacy, that's a huge legacy. Mm -hmm. Now there's another legacy that we get from them too, and that is a style of communication, right? Top down military command and control communication tends to be the way that that communication in the businesses happened during the traditions. So now you know this style because you know the answer to this question. When under that style of communication, when the boss says jump, you say. Ah. Excellent. Very good. You're very good at that. Okay. <laughs> so, but if you say jump to someone. My generation. What's she gonna say? What do we say? Why? <laughs> Why? Or like, I got a whole new way of jumping. Let me show you. That. <laughs> right. We were actually doing this on the big There was a millennial in the room. We said, you know, we said, to our, what, what do we say? And he's like, screw you. Okay. Those Canadians. Yeah, north of the border, Russia. I guess. I don't know. But we do, we question and we ask why, because we grew up in an environment where we could question and talk openly with authority from you know, the age of three. Yeah, and, and, and so that collaboration is just part of who we are. Yep. I think uh, one way to get a grip on this difference, this major cultural shift between jump and why, is to look at a couple of visuals. Um, if we look at this, we see, um, the traditionalist style of communication is Now, if this is your style of communication, there are some assumptions you make about the way that information is held. Where is the information at, on, this, on this chart? It's at the top. Where is it going to stay? At the top. The only communication is vertical, and notice that every level is essentially a roadblock to communication. 
Now, when I entered the workplace, this was how the workplace looked to me. This was how it functioned, and that felt perfectly natural because this was the way my whole world looked. Everything, church, Rotary Club, community, government, family, everything was stratified. That's the way it worked. That was natural. But let's flash forward a couple of generations, and I look at my millennial daughters, and they enter the workplace, and it looks like this to me. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like this to me. The whole world looks like this to them. Their experience of the classroom, of church, of community, looks more like a network than a hierarchy. There are different assumptions about communication in this model. It's faster, and who do you have access to? Everybody. What information do you have access to with this model? All of them. And about this model, too, when, when I look at this, I see that communication. I can talk to anyone at any time. That's the world that I know. But what this also shows is a fluidity of constant change. Mm -hmm. Our entire world has been changing at such a fast rate from such a young age. And I think, I mean, if you just even think in the past 15 years in your industry and education, there's been a lot of change going on there too. And a lot of this change is due to technology. It has really just advanced that rate so fast and it's moving so rapidly. And a big part of that is that we can access information at anywhere at any time. And no one can really navigate this black hole of information like millennials. So the way this, this kind of works for us is we learn something, we read something in, a, in an article, we read something in a book, and then a week later, we see that that something has changed. And we, we can look it up online, and it's something completely different, maybe there's a slight modification, so what is in this text is, is outdated. So you can understand that when we are in the classroom, when we are in the workplace for the first time, we feel this pressure to know how what we're learning is going to be relevant a year from now, or is going to be relevant three years from now. And this is a big challenge for millennials when we learn something. And I was talking to, to Kim, Director of Counseling at Key High, and she said her students come to her with these questions all the time. They ask, when will I use this? They ask, why do I need to know this? A question that would not have occurred to me as a baby. Right. I learned for learning's sake. I learned what they told me to learn. I really did. But when we're dealing with millennials, this is an important tip. Whether we're in the workplace or whether we're in education, we have to answer the why. We have to explain why again and again and again. And it's because millennials, they're going to push back. They're going to say, why does this case study matter? Why do I need to know this information? They want to know what is practical. They want to know what is applicable of the speed of change with which they up. And when we learn those different things, when that why is explained to us, it feels like reality. It feels like we can put ourselves in those shoes of another person, we can understand how it is going to benefit us in real life. And when I was talking to Kim, she said that something that she does, which I think is so wonderful, is people come from the industry into the classroom. And I was talking to Sue about this too, and you talk to alumni, and you have people come in and say, I was in your shoes five years ago one year ago, and I can tell you that what I learned here has benefited me so much, and this is how. So, you know, for other generations, for baby boomers and traditionalists, and, and even and even experts too, this is something that you didn't, you didn't have to have people connect the dots for you. This is something you already knew. You knew that what you were doing was important, because it was going to help you later on. Yeah, and I wanted to bring up the word engagement while we're here, yes. because especially in the business world, we hear that word engagement a lot. How do you engage millennials? And one of the keys when we look at managers who have millennials who work for them, who are engaged, is that relentless explanation of why. Mm -hmm. And I will say, you know, it, it doesn't take much. It's just one traditionalist or someone of another generation just kind of taking a millennial under their wing for a little bit. Because we as millennials, I mean, we know that the other generations, they can definitely always teach us a thing or two. I'm glad you know that. <laughs>
trivia. We're going to do some more songs. <laughs> All right. Nothing was experienced. All right, music trivia number four. Ah. 
optimism and that idealism is a fierce competitive spirit because you don't grow up with 80 million cohorts and not feel that heat on your back. So when you were in the school, there weren't enough desks, there weren't enough books, there wasn't enough oil to fill your cars, and when you got into the workplace, there weren't enough jobs. <coughs> so baby boomers became incredibly competitive and they got there five minutes before the boss got there and left five minutes after the boss left because they knew that if they didn't, there were 80 million people waiting in line who would. Yeah, earlier we mentioned that, that those things that affect us just as we enter the workplace, because the 60s were growth, growth, growth. Early right. 70s, we get the oil embargo and we get a contraction of the economy. Boomers were just coming to work. As Pam said, there weren't enough jobs for us. It was very, very tight. Mm -hmm. And so in order to be seen in that crowded job market, in order to be seen among 80 million others, we had to be competitive. And one way we became competitive was to develop those marvels. Models, though. Uh, interpersonal skills. We learned to read tone of voice. I know boomers who can hear three words on the phone and tell you not just what your mood is, but what you had for breakfast. <laughs> we learned to read body language at 300 yards. And we became very, very good at meetings. We're so good at meetings. We love meetings. <laughs> yes, we became very good at meetings because it, it, it gave us the ability to, to document our, it was important to our careers. We could document our contributions with meetings. Those were important to us. And it was a, 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 an arena where we excelled because it was face-to-face. -face and we knew how to do that face-to-face -face stuff. <clears throat> no, no offense, but unlike some millennials who run their whole lives from a device. Yeah. 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 We didn't really. We didn't have to learn those skills from an early age. That that wasn't something that we had to be good at to succeed in school. It wasn't something we had to be good at first day on the job. At least we didn't know that it was. We didn't know that it was. We didn't know that it was. But I will say that I do have good news here because even though we we lack those face-to-face -face communication skills and those telephone skills just right off the bat. We want to know how to do it, and we want to learn because it is something that it is a big weakness for a lot of the millennial generation. I was actually just speaking with a college last week, and I was talking to a lot of students, and I can tell you pretty much every single one of them said, yeah, we use email for everything. It's so easy. Some of my professors, they even let us text them. It's great. I was like, okay, cool, but you know, what about, how do you feel when you talk to them in person? And every single person said, I learn so much more when I take more time to talk to them in person and I'm worried that I'm going to be scared to do that in the workplace because I don't have those skills and I don't know how to do that. So we millennials, we know. We know we don't have them. And also when, when we're in the workplace for the first time and we see other people succeeding because they can read body language from 300 feet away, we want to know how to do that too. So I know the challenge is here that millennials sometimes struggle to admit what they don't know. And it can be kind of hard for us. And we feel like we have so much to teach other generations too. We know all this technology and we're up on information all the time. We're always online. So the best way to really bring these generations together is through cross-generational learning. And what this does is it gives baby boomers the opportunity to teach all of these skills that they have and when they are able to teach other people, they're really making an impact on their lives. And I think that that, that feels pretty good, right? Sure. And for millennials, we get to teach something that we know a lot about. So it's a, really a lot of different perspectives and they're going back and forth and you're learning from each other. And that is when those magic moments happen and these relationships are built. And then you have this strength and this bond that you can kind of carry through to your next project and through your next years in the workforce. And there is, there are a lot of examples in the industry of how this is being done. And one in particular that I especially love is what Google is doing. Because they're kind of leading by example with something that I think a lot of other industries and a lot of other companies, no matter the size, um, and no matter you know where they're located, they can all do this. So they have this program called Googler to Googler, which is an awful. Um, but what it is, is it's this mentorship and this teaching program. And anyone from the company goes to HR, who, who is the one who plans everything, and they say, I, I'm really passionate about managing. And I would love to teach other people what I learned about managing. And so then they get to teach it. 
and anyone can go, it doesn't matter your level in the company, everyone can go and learn from that person. At the same time, a, a young person can go in and say, I really want to teach people about Snapchat, and I think people need to understand how this can be beneficial. As an enabled section. I mean, what? Snapchat. Snapchat. In case you don't know. Yeah. It's, it's an app, and it's just a different kind of communication technology tool. Okay. And that's what I'm talking about, though. Like, it's these opportunities to teach new things all the time, so it's these lear this learning process that's going back and forth. And it really does just build this relationship and this strength and this bonding, so we can really just continue to learn from each other. So when I come up against a technology problem, guess who's off the sidewalk? <laughs> That cross meant that cross learning, yeah. which is no longer what it was, goes against the grain for me as a big one. It does. Because when I was uh, first with the workplace, mentoring happened from the top down. That was the role. And I expected, as I assumed it, into management that I would always be mentoring top down. <laughs> Not so. Not so. Change changed everything. Technology changed everything. So that now it's like a, it's no longer a layer cake. It's, I don't know, it's an apple crisp or something. But we all have things to teach each other. Now another piece of this that gets in the way of that cross-generational collaboration is the perception of work ethic. And I use the word perception carefully because we are so different that we may not perceive the work ethic of the other generation or we may diss the work ethic of the other generation. I know uh, we boomers get dissed as, what are we been called? Workaholics, right, get alive, all that stuff, you know. Um, yeah. I guess there's a reason for that because when I did go into the workplace, I did derive a lot of my identity from my job. I really did. It was a 24-7 way of being. My work was more of a calling than a job. That was just the era in which I grew up and the way that I entered the workplace. And it did result in some crazy hours. It did result in some crazy hours. And so when I look at Hannah pounding on email at midnight, but not in the office at nine, She's taking a yoga class or something. You know. <laughs> Personal fulfillment time, I don't know, something. Um, then, then, you know, I can have a, a, the wrong perception about how Right, so what got that? Yeah, because what, what we millennials do, because of, of how we, we grew up and because of technology, we work, definitely, and we live. And the two are really intertwined. I mean, we're the generation of work-life integration. We talk about Gen X, it's work-life balance. And millennials, really, they want to integrate it. So I can go to my yoga class at 9, but I know that I'm going to be working on a project from 11 to 2 a.m. And it'll be ready by the next morning. And it'll be done on time. So we have this kind of different perception of work ethic. And we do work hard. And we do want to work hard. And we are incredibly motivated. Yeah, and we're aware that some jobs cannot be flexed. Those hours cannot be flexed for some jobs. But on the other hand, that appreciation or mutual appreciation for work ethic has to develop given the technology that we have, or else there's a huge disconnect, or else we really can't work together. Um, so you said that millennials are motivated, yes. and I was surprised as our research over the last few years revealed what motivated millennials. <clears throat> I'm a boomer. Throw a, a, a new title at me. Ha, ha, I'm motivated. <laughs> Throw a little more money my way, and I'm ready to work, right? But you go to the millennial generation, and because they grew up so differently, we find that they are motivated mostly by, get this, meaning, meaning. The power of the impact of what they do, the meaning of their work, has a profound effect on them. Uh, do you have that global study? Um, yes, there was a global study. It was done by um, Edelman 8095. They did this really big research study of all millennials all across the globe. And they found that the number one life goal, the number one life goal of all these millennials is having a job with purpose that matches my personal passion. And there have been other repeated studies in which the majority of the millennials will say, yeah, I would trade this job for one that pays less money if it had more meaning. Meaning. They keep coming back to that word. Meaning and purpose. And I'm sure that many of you out there are saying, yes, of course, meaning everyone wants meaning in their work, that's nothing new. But the difference is that other generations, baby boomers especially, I mean, you, you came in, you rolled up your sleeves, you put your head down, and you worked really hard, and then you ascended into a role. I, I have mean? impact later on. Exactly. My job will have more meaning later on. But we millennials, we come in, and on day one, that first day on the job, we want to have meaning in our work. 
So something that you can do to help millennials see the meaning that they're having in the work is just connecting the dots to them. And sometimes this isn't really obvious to millennials, especially if it's very common for millennials, you know, if you come right out of high school, if you're coming right out of, right out of college and you get an entry level job and maybe you're doing data entry every day. Or maybe you're working on a machine and you do very similar things every morning and that's just kind of the way it works. And it's hard sometimes when you're in that routine to see the difference that you're making. And if you're an organiz in an organization that's built like a traditional org chart and you see yourself at the bottom, it's hard to understand how you contribute to the big picture. But you, know, you don't have to be saving lives to have meaning in your work. So simply sitting down with a millennial and saying, what you're doing this morning, it affects Amy down the hall, and it affects her whole team of people she works with, and that team affects the company's big picture, and the big picture of the company affects the community. And it's really hard for us to see that right away. And all it takes is for someone to just plot it out for us. And then once we have that understanding and we really feel like we have meaning in that work we're doing, we'll feel more motivated the next day when we come to work. And we'll feel more motivated to work harder to proceed on in our career and get to those different positions where we know that meaning right away. Yeah, I love what Molly said when she first was talking at, very early in the morning, and yeah. she was talking about the young guy who was sitting up in front of a shop like and she said, you're going to build this industry. Yes. That's the kind of, of work, that's the kind of connecting the dots that millennials need. We forget, if we've been in the industry for a while, or if we've been in education for a while, you know, it's easy for us, we take it for granted. We know the impact we have on the community and on people's lives. We know that. And I tend to forget that millennials don't know that. I'll, I'll give you a way. May I ask you? I suppose, yes, you can. At the top of Hannah's speech this morning, I was so, I looked at her script, and she had written in nice, big, in a, <laughs> changing <laughs> lives. <laughs> changing lives. You know, I, this is, <laughs> this is one of those real moments. I was, you know, I'm moved by that. I'm moved by her commitment to changing lives. And I don't think she's alone. I don't think she's alone. Millennials may sometimes lose their way to that, to that fact, to that goal. But if we can keep them on that path, then they're going to be engaged. Yeah, and um, HP came out with this commercial that, for me as a millennial, gives me chills. And it really just calls on a powerful, um, powerful meaning. It's something you're born with and inspires the things you choose to do. You do what you do because it matters. At HP, we don't just believe in the power of technology. We believe in the power of people when technology works for you to dream, to create, to work. If you're going to do something, Done the traditional boomer, we're going to move to Gen Xers next. But let me, let's do it. Are there any questions that are, that are coming up for you? Any pushback that's coming up for you that we can just take a second and address at this point? Yes. Yeah. Just, I'm a tail end of the boomer. Uh, mm -hmm. I have two young, two boys. Um, and I, I just see like that commercial uh, there. I think I've kind of resisted the technology, so I don't see that I'm in competition. Right. And I don't know if you can hear what he said, but as a boomer parent, he sometimes feels like he's in competition with the technology that was in that ad. Rather than knowing how to use it to connect, it feels like it, it eats with your children's time in a way that you feel it's, it's hard to compete with. Is that what I heard? Yeah. 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 And this one thing that's interesting to me is as we've done the research forward, because we'll be talking about future generations today, um, it is that they use technology in such an integrated and connected way. So that when they connect digitally, they feel it this way. That high tech feels like high touch the younger you are. That's a difference. I see it as, I, I'm a boomer too, I see that screen is separating us, but if I'm teaching high schoolers, 
the high schoolers I'm teaching see that screen as just, you know, a memory that you have part of life. Yeah. She really embraced that and has got a relationship going on. That's hard, isn't it? State, I have talked to you. Yes. <laughs> 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 you don't text him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he texts his mother. He texts his mother. Okay. Yes, it might. I have another question, and that is as I listen to you, I'm thinking about the millennials as a generation, but I'm thinking about kind of the motivated right millennials. And I'm yeah. wondering, are we really talking about the entire generation, or are we really only talking about a segment of that, that a, generation? That is a question that comes up all the time. Yes. <laughs> it does. It comes up all the time because I think it's sometimes it's, it's harder to see. And what I will say is that from the motivated and, and the right millennials is really high quality, top people in school and everything, you see this much more easily, and it comes faster, and you see that motivation and that come through a lot more quickly. But it's in every millennial's fiber of their being deep down, because we all grew up with these events and conditions. And I think that, you know, of course, there are always exceptions, and there are always different people and in different communities, and so that does come into play. But when we look at big trends, and when we do research, and we do research on millennials everywhere in, in different socioeconomic statuses and everything too, and research that comes out from other organizations, it's, it's pretty powerful to see how we do share these qualities. I think that the difference is just that those, those, those top millennials, they exhibit them more quickly. Yeah, and let me, it, it is it's just more obvious when you're talking about high potential millennials, high, or high achievers, I shouldn't mm -hmm. say high potential, I think. Yes, um, uh, they, I, I was, just, in, in response to what you said, Sue, I was thinking about a couple of examples of that. Um, in, in industry, uh, sometimes we're thinking, well, this is a person who has chosen a job that is kind of repetitive or transactional and it just goes on. And so maybe this millennial isn't going to respond to these tips. But our research does tell us that, say, in industry, if the manager is somebody who's collaborative, who says, how can we do this work better, and really invites that input uh, over time, that the millennial is more likely to be engaged, less likely to leave that job. So that, that collaborative piece, that will you talk to me about how we do this work piece, is something that does engage millennials, no matter whether they're in a legal firm or on a factory floor. Um, one group that I worked with was a fascinating group. Um, they service um, loans, okay? This is really boring work. These were millennials who came in by the hundreds to this company, and they would sit and they would be on the phone, and they would call somebody and say, you know, you missed your payment. This is really boring work. They wrote a script, and, and, and they service loans. Anybody here in this business servicing mortgages? <coughs> OK, all right. Do you have people on the phones? It's repetitive work. And um, as I was working with this group, this was in Knoxville, Tennessee, we, we developed a couple of things. One was that they would meet in groups to collaborate. And they would say, this was a problem for me. I came up against, you know, the script didn't work. And they would brainstorm about ways, and the millennials were asked to brainstorm ways to, to answer and to have a solution to that. The other piece of that that made a difference, and this is a difference that popped, you could see, see the trend. Uh, Turner would basically went to nothing as soon as they began to do this. And that was their managers at the end of each um, week would we call them together, and they would measure how many calls they've done and all that stuff. I mean, that was obviously the metrics they were working with. And then the manager would turn those into <coughs> metrics that mattered, metrics that had meaning. He would say, Doc, you kept 14 people in their homes this week. You resolved that situation. And it, that just that piece of meaning from work that, you know, is, was, was repetitive really brought that, that turnover rate down in that industry. So that's just an example of, of situations where if you just think about how do we make this collaborative, might not look collaborative on the surface. How do we give this meaning? Might not look neat like it has meaning on the surface. But if we can do that, then it does help to engage those women. Great. Shall we? Shall we go on? Let's, are there any other points, that this, any other things you want to raise at this point? Yes. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, where is everything? Where is everything made? And then what's the answer to that question? When we ask if it's in the room, where do they get everything that's made? Where do they get everything? Piece of meaning. It's like, who made that? That's the answer to China. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. The problem is that a lot of it is made in China, but that's where everybody thinks it's made. Yes. So if you think you're going to make someplace else and it never occurs to you, you might have to help out to make it. Exactly. Exactly. Because we have that perception. Because what we see all the time are solutions. What we see all the time are answers. We see the lights and we're like, okay, great. You call someone to get lights and you get the lights. You call someone to get the chairs and you get the chairs. And you don't, and you know, it's that. And it's also, if you're looking at a science problem or something like that and you want a quick solution to an answer, you type it in online, you get the answer. Do you take the time to go through all of the work and the solution to get there? No. But that's one reason that what can happen in this room today, mm -hmm. by the end of the day, is so powerful. Because yes. if you can bring that industry into the classroom, yeah, and bring those. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. This is a turning point, though, from what I understand. That some of that, some of those jobs that have gone offshore are starting to come back. Kind of. Yeah, kind of, in some areas at least. Yeah. Yeah. I think in order to really have it happen faster, we have to start having people wonder, well, let's make it here. Mm -hmm. Let's make it here, what do I have to do to get some part of it? Let people look at the building and put it in the center of the stuff all of a sudden. Yeah. Passion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like right. People are building these skyscrapers and stuff, but those people that are doing that are, you know, trade things. Right, and we were talking earlier about the lack of tradesmen uh, who are out there, and part of it, it's it's huge. The awareness in the classrooms isn't there because we did go through this stage. I admit it as a teacher, we went through this stage in education where we tried to send everybody to college, you know, and and it just it's it's it has now we're reaping the the problem that really relates from that with the with the imbalance. So. Um, um, I like what, what Hannah said about what you're used to seeing are solutions mm -hmm. and not the way we got there. Not the products, the way that the products were built and developed. Well, I think a lot of people now think that, you know, if you need it, buy it versus if you need it, make it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, yeah, if you need it, buy it as opposed to make it. Well, maybe I can actually make it. And people like that, the younger generation, you know, it's, well, just buy it. Right. So, yes. And so the, exactly, because it won't it won't hold up. The system won't hold. However, what I see in this room is a marvelous potential. We've got people sitting in this room, guidance counselors and, and other educators who are willing to bring that awareness of industry and manufacturing into the, into the school. And we've got business people here who are willing to work with that process too and to say, here's what we need and, and make that cross generation and that cross fertilization happen. I mean, this is that's the magic of what you guys can do here. And as Hannah said to begin with, we speak to a lot of groups, a lot of corporate groups usually, and this is such an unusual and marvelous thing that you're that you're doing. It's such a far sighted thing. Uh, let's do one other comment. One of the ad that Dave was talking about my son Brian and Dan is an example. We run a machine shop, and uh, Brian uh, is in the uh, program at Penn State with an internship with us. And what, what Hannah says, uh, we had him on a machine. He's, he's to me, I, you know, taking raw material and adding value. So he goes into a product, we're selling the masters, so have to contribute to the community and all the bigger picture stuff. And I actually went through and explained all that to him and talked to him about it. The light bulbs go off. And I think baby boomers and other generations understood that yes. bigger picture. Yep. He did that. So explain to them that the value of what you're doing, you're making components that are going to go into something that, that has purpose and meaning, uh, really helps.
helped him understand it wasn't just drilling a hole and giving right. some trivial oil to right. a sweeping floor or something like that. It's that connecting the dots and explaining Absolutely. why and how this has an impact. Because like, as you said, we can assume that because of the era in which we grew up and we forget to express that to the level. Well, it's a frustrating to me that I have to explain that to you. Yeah, it is. Why would I have to explain that, right? And, and you know, from the perspective of a millennial person, we're like, why is this frustrating to you? I have no idea. I have no clue. So it is. It's one of those. It's like, I can see I'm making you crazy. Why? Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's transition now. And, and thank you, everyone, for sharing. We are going to have more time for Q&A at the end. So just kind of keep track of anything that comes to mind as we go along here throughout the rest of this. And we're going to shift. So we've talked about traditionalists and baby boomers. And we're going to talk about Generation X. Oh, you know what? Are we doing music trivia right now? Did I almost stop us from doing music trivia? Oh, we don't want to stop. Oh my gosh. What am I doing? Pull out your music trivia sheets. I can't believe I almost skipped over that. All right, number six. <laughs> What is the name of this group's long-time drummer? <laughs> All right, next. Trivia number seven. <laughs> Give them a project and they're like, great, 
thanks, tell me what you want, where you want it, how you want it, when you want it. Now, I'm going to go away. Hopefully, you're going to go away. <laughs> and then we can get it done. <laughs> so they have this fierce independence. But at the heart of Xers is that skepticism. And when we talk about Xers and their movement into the workplace, I mean, this is a generation that's had their parents and their neighbors and their parents' friends all being part of these big layoffs in the 70s and the 80s. So they had this completely different mentality than, say, the baby boomer generation. And Monster.com was really the first company to reach these, these heartstrings of Generation X. And this is an example of a commercial from one of their campaigns. When I grow up, I want to fly all day. Or on my way up to middle management, be replaced on a lamp. I want to have a brown nose. I want to be a yes man. Yes woman. Yes sir. Coming I mean, sir. Anything for a raise, sir. When I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be underappreciated. Be paid less for doing the same job. I want to be forced into early retirement. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. 
And my mom very lovingly said, well, why don't you just go talk to her? I was like, I can't talk to her. Are you kidding me? She's just going to give me more negative feedback. So I, I was thinking about this paper for a long time because it was really eating at me. And I decided to go talk to her three weeks later. And I, I, I walk into her office and very hesitantly. And I'm like, hi, I want to talk to you about that. And she said, Hannah, geez, it took you forever to come in here. You have potential. You just need to work on it. Let's talk about it. Sit down. So I realized in that moment that I was, of course, being very silly and ridiculous because this excerpt professor of mine, she would not have marked up my paper so much and not have given me so much constructive feedback if she didn't care about how I could improve. And that was a hard lesson for me, but I'm very glad that I was fortunate enough to learn it early on in my, in my college years. But there are a whole lot of millennials out there like me, and I'm sure that some of you probably have had some experiences with them, because we bring this, this, this anxiety with us about negative feedback into the workplace. And so there is something really easy to do about this. And you know, we've worked with a lot of companies and a lot of clients, and they have this millennial turnover, and they don't understand. They don't understand why it's happening. And we look at the exit interviews, and almost every single time, it can be traced back to that first time they receive feedback. Because if a millennial gets negative feedback, but they don't receive a plan about how to improve, it, they can just feel completely deflated and they check out. So something that you can do is give them feedback. Millennials, we respond to constant feedback. So hearing it more than just once every year. And when we do receive feedback, if it is negative, because of course that's going to happen. We make mistakes all the time. And, and we need help. But when we do, give us a plan. Help us learn how we can be better. Because if we see that we're not doing something correctly, but we see how we can be doing something so much better down the line, we'll want to do it. And then we'll feel motivated to push through that feedback so then we can get that wonderful positive feedback that we do love hearing so much. Now before we jump on this bandwagon and make too yeah. much, I'm sorry, I was making fun of the millennials for not being able to take feedback. <laughs> right. But uh, I do love the clip that we have that kind of illustrates the way that millennials were raised by us. What's that? It's you! It's the wall of Game Boy. The wall of Game Boy. Isn't it nice to finally display your accomplishments, son? Yeah. Oh, you got your awards. That's great. It's my kid. Well, I didn't know they made ninth place ribbons. <laughs> oh, yeah, they got them all the way up to tenth place. We have always tried to instill a sense of self in Gaylord, not being too goal oriented. Not about winning or losing, it's about passion. We just wanted him to love what he's doing. You know what I mean, Jay? Not really, Bernard. I think a competitive drive is the essential key that makes America the only remaining superpower in the world today. Well, whatever works. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah was talking about that constant feedback. Mm -hmm. And by constant, well, the word frequent comes up, you know, we say give frequent come back, come back. And, and for a boomer, that means monthly, right? Sure. Right. But for a millennial, it means weekly, if possible. I mean, really, we want it every single day, every single project, but that is not realistic. Any of you who are Gen Xers, have you noticed the, the tendency of millennials to linger over your desk <laughs> with questions? And then another question? And then another question? So it's something that we have to learn how to manage. If you're a Gen Xer or if you're a boomer, you may be more tolerant of that. But if you're a Gen Xer, you may think, <laughs> I'm here. I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'd rather, I want to work at my own pace in my own space. You know, I'd rather sit in a cave all day and do my work than, you know, than have to deal with this constant back and forth. Um, so it's a huge collision between hyper-collaborative millennials and hyper-independent Gen Xers. We see it all the time in our work. The Gen Xer who has a group of millennials to manage and Gen Xer goes to the door, looks out, all the millennials are out there. They're not only talking to each other, they're online together in Google Hangout, and they're texting each other. And it's all blah, 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 back and forth, back and forth. And the Gen Xer's like, I'm not going up there. It's a mosh pit. You know, it's a mess out there. It's scary. I've got work to do. As a matter of fact, I was talking, I got so tickled a few weeks ago, I was talking to one Gen X manager, and she showed me a text that she'd gotten. It was like that. Brain session seven. That was a text that she got. And what it meant was that her millennial team, how many of you would know what to do with that? Show it's done. Perfect. Perfect. It's it's a um, it's an invitation that a millennial sent her. It works for her. 
It's an invitation to come to the brainstorming session at 7 in the cafe in the, in the, the company where they work. Now, what she was telling me, her frustration was that not only would they brain session at 7, uh, they would hang out in somebody's cubicle all day. They'd also be on, uh, online hanging out, exchanging ideas all day long. They would go for drinks after work, and they would Skype that night. <laughs> they were like, do you want to join us? And she's like, no, because she's a genetic. She's a genetic. And all that constant give and take gets in her way as opposed to moving forward, moving the work forward. But for millennials, it just works forward. It does, because I mean, we grew up, and, and teamwork is our middle name. We always want to work in groups. I mean, if you just think, too, about the messaging that we heard when we were growing up, it shows how different we are. Xers, when you grew up, were growing up, the messaging you heard was, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Millennials, the messaging we've heard is, there's no I in team. <laughs> Two heads are better than one. Three heads are better than two. We are stronger together than we are apart. So we really we do have this mentality. We want to collaborate all the time. But that does not always work because other people of other generations are like, that is not productive. And we talk to a lot of Xers and a lot of Xer managers, and they say, we love to collaborate. That's great, but there's a very efficient way to do it. We brainstorm first, we come up with three big ideas, and then we come together and collaborate. So millennials, we don't really know about this. And again, it's just teaching us how to collaborate. And it's teaching us when to do this. Knowing that collaboration is fantastic, but saying, love, love your ideas. When we're batting down those extra doors, we're like, we have so many ideas, and I want to stop you in the hallway, and can I kind of come over here and tell you this now? We just thought of this really great idea. I'm going to shoot you a text. Hold, hold on to those. Yeah. Ah, just keep them in. We're from Minneapolis, you know, the home of Betty Crocker. And uh, there was a millennial who actually showed up for an internship there a few years ago. She had she brought in a recipe the first day that she wanted the company to do, you know, <laughs> a new product, first day. It was just so natural for her to bring her ideas forward all the time. Right. All the time. She had to learn how and when to present those. Recipes. Yes. And when we learn how and when to present those, we learn how and when we can bring our voice to the table. And we know that when we have those opportunities, we can make an impression in the work that we're doing, and we can maybe move some of our big ideas forward. So it's just taking those moments to teach us how to collaborate. So we've talked about all the generations working with millennials, and we've talked about how explaining the why is so incredibly important, about structuring collaboration, about connecting the dots for us, so we talked about all about that bad stuff about the millennials. But what about the generation that's coming next? So I'm sure that many of you are working with them right now in high schools. I mean, the oldest of them is going to be in the workforce this coming fall. This is the group born from 1996 to about 2010. The exact year isn't complete yet because there hasn't enough, there hasn't enough time that's gone by. But you're, you're working with a lot of these people, and some of them are your children. And I will say, too, that you know those people who are in, in their upper ages of Generation Ed, when we talk about cuspers, this is playing out with them, too. Because it's not like someone goes to sleep December 31st, um, you know, 1995, and another person is born on January 1st, 1996, and is a completely different person. There, there aren't hard and fast rules with those years. But we want to talk to you about this next generation because we are really excited about them and they have so much to offer. They're looking different than millennials. And the easiest way that we have found to really tell you about who they are is through three trends that we're seeing. But overall, I would say the overarching theme with this generation is that Generation Edge sees the world a little differently. This is this is in Dutch, um, which is does anybody here speak Dutch? Okay, that's good because I translated this with of course Google Translate, and so I always I wonder if it, it means something but different than what that tells me. But it, what it says is digital natives see the world differently, and digital natives is the word that they use. We use Generation Edge. Yeah, and uh, I know Hannah is knee deep in the research on Gen Edge right now. Um, but are you spending a lot of time with 12-year-olds at present, right? 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, every age. Every age. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, one, one of the trends that we're seeing, which is huge, is speed, because this is a generation that grew up with even more technology than before at their fingertips, and in fact, connected. You know, um, the, the newest device that's going to be with us very soon is that iPhone that does everything that's on the wrist. It's literally connected to your body. You know, so they are growing up with technology at their fingertips. They're faster than ever. They can find information in a heartbeat, even faster than millennials could. In fact, they're going to be so good at processing data, the data that comes to them digitally through technology, that when we study their IQs, their IQs may are, are predicted to be classical IQ studies may be may be very high because of that that fast ability to process. Um, the other thing that's important to, to kind of think about with this group that I think is, is surprising me when I look at look at things is their resourcefulness because they are going to be so good at finding solutions that they're not going to be quite like the millennials who may come to you with questions. This group is more likely to go online and find it, find that solution. They're likely to be very resourceful, and if they can't find a solution or an answer, they're going to create it. We're seeing them as very resourceful and very independent. I'm very proud of this. They're kind of an interesting group. Yeah, and if you even just extend that a little bit further, you know, you should mention, Amy mentioned millennials. The first person that we go to, and we found this in studies, uh, and the research that we go to Bridgeburg, is you go to mom and dad, or, or you go to your teacher, if you have a big question about, you know, buying an apartment, or you need to fix your car, you, you, you ask mom and dad. But this generation, they don't do that. They look online first. So the second trend that we're seeing with them, um, I call you've got a friend in me. Because this is a generation that has been through a lot. I mean, this is the generation that has grown up in the heart of the Great Recession. They've seen global terrorism and a lot of tragic national events blasted at them 24 hours a day through social media. It's just the norm for them. And the people they turn to in these situations are their friends. And most often, the way they're turning to them is through technology. And this is actually, I know that sometimes this can be kind of a challenge because people are seeing these people who are connected to technology all the time. It's like they, they, can't, they can't have any relationships with people in person. It's so hard for them. But what's so cool about them, what I actually am really impressed by, is that they develop strong relationships with people online. They can do it through Skype. They can do it through Facebook. They're able to have these conversations that even I as a millennial struggle to have. So there is a study that was done, and it found that 26% of Gen Edgers say they have friends who are playing right away. Half of their Facebook friends are playing right away. So in the workforce, what this means is that they're going to be able to develop relationships with anyone, anywhere. And they can do this so easily and with such ease that, that it's no problem whatsoever. And I think that especially you know, as the world and, and the broader scale is going to be going global, they're just going to be able to develop these relationships in heartbeat. And I think that's a really big advantage that they're going to have in the workforce. Third trend that we're seeing with them is a participation award is not a real award. <laughs> and I do think that we have some Gen X parents, maybe some in the room, to thank for this because Gen Xers are really learning the art of failure. From their Gen X parents. Yeah, because it, it isn't normal to get a sixth place honorable mention trophy in a swim meet when six people were in the race. Did you, are you pointing to yourself? Maybe. <laughs> it's, it's not realistic. And so what we're finding is because this is more of a realistic generation and we have these Gen X parents, they are going to bring a really fierce competitive fire back into the workforce. And I was actually speaking with a university women's basketball coach just a couple weeks ago. And she was telling me she works with a lot of high school girls. And a lot of people started from the age of about 6th grade to 11th grade. And she said she has never seen, in her 30 years of coaching, she has never seen kids as competitive as they are today. So every generation, they bring something new and wonderful into the workplace. I mean, boomers brought that optimism, that idealism. Xers brought that challenging of the status quo. Millennials brought that collaboration and that power to create innovation from that. And Gen Edgers, they're going to be bringing this competitive fire. And I think that's really exciting to see how that is going to play out in the workforce. I'm curious, since we have a lot of uh, guidance counselors here and other educators who deal with Gen Edge. This is, a, by the way, only in the last year or two have we begun to 
parse out and separate this group from the millennial generation. The millennials are very much shaped by the laptop computer, very much shaped by, by the internet, very much shaped by social media, but not as much as the edgers. That sense of really being shaped deeply by interactive social media, visual social media, is profound, and we begin to see differences, and we begin just in the last couple of years to separate this group out. Um, so I'm, I'm curious because you guys are working with this group, uh, if, if this rings true, or if you have other observations about this group, about how fast they are, how competitive they are, how how uh, interactive they are. Do you have observations about this group?
And so um, that is something too with their multitasking. I think in the in the future, it's something that will have to be more structured around when you can use your multiple devices. And we have to be careful about the difference between perception and reality. Yeah. Um, I, I see some, some heads nodding. If in fact the work is getting done, if in fact the learning is happening, then multitasking is not a problem. If it's not getting done, the learning is not happening, then multitasking is a problem. Right. If in fact we've got to go deep and make a strategic decision, multitasking doesn't work. But if it's transactional, if it's keeping a lot of balls in the air, it's, if it's taking care of business in a, in a fast way, then multitasking can work. So we yeah. have to really, and this is so hard for me, because it irritates me, you know, to see somebody multitasking, I'm trying to talk to them. If the work is getting done, then I have to work on my perception as opposed to, um, to how I know. Exactly. Yeah. So let's take maybe one more question and then we'll kind of close up here. Mm -hmm. girls 12 and 14, they multitask all the time, get straight A's. Do they multitask while they're doing their homework? That's the darndest thing. I couldn't have done that. I grew up reading. R-E-A-D-I-N-G, reading. Yeah, so. I'm just going to go try something else. 
which is so hard for other generations to hear. They're like, you cannot do that. That's not secure. That's not safe. Do you know about retirement? Like, you can't. You need to set yourself up for success. But millennials think they're setting themselves up for success in that. Because going from different jobs, you're learning different skills and learning new opportunities. And we, we talk a lot about you know engaging people and starting to get them to think long term. And there are so many elements that go into that. And there are so many practices that, that really work in tandem and work together to get people to start thinking that way. And it's also totally normal, of course, when young people come to, into industry and they can only think in terms of semesters, right? That's, 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 the, that's the horizon, a, sem a semester long. Uh, that's just the way that our brains work sometimes at that life stage, and it's all that they have. Uh, experience. But one thing to keep in mind is that we know we've had some studies that tell us that this job jumping that Hannah's talking about is prevalent in early 20s. And then something happens about age 26. It's kind of like a bump in the road and it slows down. So if you're in, in business and you've got people and they come and they say only a year and you're just barely, you know, you're barely beginning to get your value back from them and then they decide to go where the grass is greener and you know it's not greener over there but they're going to go, make sure you leave that door open. Make sure you leave that door wide open. Keep contacting them, keep talking to them, keep on their email, email list, invite them to company events. Make that door wide open and invite them back to work for you if you, if you like them every six months. Because they will slow down those moves as they move through their 20s and you get them back and they're better than they were before because they, they've got that added experience. And I will say, especially in a community like this one, I mean, this yeah. isn't Silicon Valley where people go out and plan on being for two years, and then afterwards they're like, do I stay here, or do I move back to the community I came from? And so that's something that's so great about this community is that it has so many resources and so much support, and there's relationships here that they know that they can come back to. And that is something with millennials, is we go back to a world that we understand. Like, we go back to the with mom and dad, where, you know, it's funny because so many of us do, and so many people rely on that. It's also very powerful because there is um, a strength there, there's a bond, and if we feel like we can see ourselves long term in a place like that. So I will say something I think that's, that's unique actually to this kind of community in this region. Yeah. So, we are running a little low on time, so I just want to make sure that we close out and that we score our music trivia and everything. Um, so just pull out your sheet, we got one more, and then we'll score it, and then we'll be all done here. Yeah.
Jersey was born and raised. New Jersey. New Jersey. Jersey. Extra point for Ashbury Park. Yep. yep. Wait, Dominic's first album was called Hello from Home. Town, you said the town. You said the stadium. That was what? Yes, and that was. Oh, not the town where you grew up. Oh, never mind. I'm sorry. So, Reggie, you're showing your app. You get an extra point if you got that right. I'm trusting you. I will too. Yes. Okay. And number eight, name a song. Lupita Lope. Live Lupita Lope. Yes, name of artist. Ricky Martin. Ricky Martin, and a member of what? Menudo. Menudo. Right. All right, total of 24 points, Adama. Okay, we'll ask you to stand if you got, let's say, 18 points. 18 points or more. Stand up. Oh, wow.